uh, for us to come around to discuss tonight. And uh, if it's okay, uh, we'd like to start with Matthew. Yeah, so um, I, I think that there's so many changes with the way we, we work and the way we live today. And in fact, last year was, was a great testament to that because we all changed the way we, we live. That um, We're seeing that every time we go through a major revolution like that, we need to kind of reinvent ourselves. We need to reinvent the rules. And I think that it's a, it's a very good forum to discuss those rules and to discuss what's actually happening what we can see coming down in the next few years as part of that revolution. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, hand over to Kat, please. Kat, you're on mute, though. Hey, sorry. You actually cut out, unfortunately. Can you please repeat the question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question was, uh, of the wonderful topics that we have to discuss uh, here at the Horasis meeting, uh, why is the Fifth Industrial Revolution uh, the one that you personally felt, you know, compelled to speak about that you wanted to be uh, part of the discussion tonight. Yeah. So for me, I think, you know, immediately when you put people in trust together, um, you know, what we do at Stark is, is um, you know, it's core, um, you know, people and trust are core. And um, I think there's something really special about what's happening in technology right now and what it's enabling people to do. And I think we haven't actually capitalized on everything that we can when it comes to accessing innovation. And I think we're going to see a lot of that. Um, with this next industrial revolution, you know, people actually um, benefiting, you know, marginalized groups, um, gaining access to everything we're putting together now, um, and us seeing a true transformation of the systems we're a part of. Very exciting. Looking forward to getting into that uh, a little bit more deeply here. Uh, but for now, let's hand it over to Marsha. Great. Well, I'm happy to be here. So I'm also representing the entrepreneurs organization. We're a partner with Oasis. And when I looked at the list, I love this topic because my purpose and the purpose of my business is to raise um, humanity's consciousness. And just looking at all the dilemmas right now with technology in my business alone, trying to support my staff who really they don't want any technology and um, also just with health, the opportunities to manage everything, monitor your health and all, all the few things. So trying to balance that with a team that, that is against the technology and I'm uh, much more of an innovator who is looking at ways where we can track it and collect data. So I found this interesting and Trust in people are really important to me. Awesome. Well, it's, it's a great way to get ahead of the curve on that. Uh, and uh, and I think, uh, you know, looking at, at some of the ways that the uh, art world is developing just these past couple of weeks, what everybody's heard about, uh, you know, the NFTs. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a ton of innovation happening in that space. Uh, great to have your perspective here with us. Uh, Amir. Um, for me, it's been... Uh, a life journey preparing for the fifth industrial revolution. I mean, for me, everything I've been doing, um, and especially everything I've been doing with my company that I founded in 2007, is going through is going through what you'll call the third and the fourth, where technologies were developed to create efficiencies and enable and enable progress as they call progress uh, being efficiency and, and and return on investment was, you know, uh, looked very narrowly as how can we make shareholders more money per share. It, it became, for me, it was when we started the company, we called it Six Cents. And my partner and I were very focused on enabling people to connect with digital, with digital medium, with technology in such a way that it becomes intuitive, that it engages their sixth sense. And, and, and we've been patiently, luckily, fortunately, we, we were able to be patient. We developed all the enabling technologies, integrated additional technologies from the AI and machine learning and anything we needed into a platform that today can focus on and that's for me the most exciting thing. Can focus on enabling, enabling the use of, of uh, all these 
technologies in, in, in healthcare and education and making it such that it's, it's, it's possible to democratize it all, to create equality, to create trust in technology, which we basically at the point where we completely lost that. I love the argument that, that, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the CEO of, uh, of Salesforce is, is made for the past couple of years that, that we, we are at the point of of technology losing the trust of the people, of, of the customer, of the of the of uh, of, of and, and when you lose trust of, of the people, which for them we make everything, then you lose all the efficiency that you thought through the third and the fourth industrial revolution that you're building it. So for me, the fifth industrial revolution is really the the ultimate goal for the whole industrial revolution, and because of that. I think this is the most important era that, that for what we do as a company that it's focused on enabling improving people's life with the use of all the available uh, resources and technologies out there. I'm done. If you um, okay. I'm having the weirdest thing happen. Uh, I, I, I apologize. Continue. I can't see or hear Amir. Uh, I was seeing a bunch of nodding along, and I, I spoke to Amir yesterday. He's, I'm sure he's making some of the best points, I, I got to tell you. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and actually probably head out and reload. Uh, but Jonathan, uh, do you mind introducing uh, you know, your, your, yourself and uh, your purpose in joining the panel? And I'm going to hit reload here because I don't want to miss a thing, uh, but I also don't want to hold up the panel by being the only person who seems to uh, not be able to see something. So I will be right back. Jonathan, please go ahead. No worries. Thank you. I was really interested in being part of this, actually partly to learn because I am not a techie and uh, I'm fascinated by um, the ideas of my peers. But I would also say I want to come from a human dimension in two different ways. One is that my observation has been that our technology has advanced much faster than our ethical frameworks for figuring out how to manage and deal with that technology. And uh, in a way, we haven't uh, fully grappled with all the implications. And that's always been true. But I think it's, with tech accelerating so fast, it becomes even more true that we don't have a consensus. And then from a professional perspective, I've been deeply involved. World have not benefited from most of this technology. And in fact, in some ways have suffered from it um, in, in many ways. So I think it's really interesting to think about a world now where literally people are moving to live with people who are like them. And increasingly that means living with people that are only in their socioeconomic status and then even in their political and other uh, psychological uh, frames. And that's not healthy for the future of our either countries or globe if we can't figure out. Historically, cities were mixed income, mixed use, and really brought all these diversity points together. And Habitat's, you know, official work is housing, but the way we do our work has always been about breaking down barriers. And so I'm really interested in how do we actually use tech to break down barriers rather than actually build them up uh, from a socioeconomic perspective. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and that was a that was a beautiful uh, way to frame up the discussion here. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, panel of, of very humane leaders uh, and the audience that we're going to make sure to take some time for questions. Uh, looking forward to a very engaged discussion. Please feel free to uh, to type and comment in the chat. Uh, I've got a couple more prepared questions that uh, that I want to make sure, um, you know, we, we seed the conversation before we open up to a larger discussion. Uh, Amir, I can see you. Hitting reload, it worked. Uh, very, very excited about that. And this next one I want to pose actually uh, to you to start, uh, which is about scarcity. Because uh, I know a, a big function of, of your platform and what you're building uh, is this idea that, you know, potentially you can take the best of, of what exists in the world uh, and use some of these fifth industrial revolution technologies uh, to make them more widespread. And so the question from your perspective, uh, and then I want to put it to other folks uh, in the group, is do you think the fifth industrial revolution will take us beyond scarcity? Why or why not? I think that uh, I think that there's a, a uniquely large number of innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, people like Jonathan here that uh, that is uh, motivated in putting their their you know blood, sweat, and tears into making it happen. Now, specifically for me, and I 100% with you, 
Um, this is our focus and our vision and our mission is to, uh, when I say, you know, democratize education and healthcare, I mean, and it's, and it's best to be communicated by a story. When I, when I sat, in, when I stood in front of Stanford, the graduating class of the medical school, and, and I and I try to picture to, to picture for them a, a, a vision where rather than being such a limited class of fortunate uh, students with these brilliant uh, professors with all the luxury of the facilities, if if, uh, if if things come the way I envision them using our platform for education, I believe that you will have. The fortunate few that can come and actually serve in person at, you know, participate in person in classes in Stanford. But the Stanford ability to reach to hundreds of thousands of additional students from every corner of the world with the use of the immersive technologies that we are enabling and enabling it such in, in, in such a what we consider to be an affordable and an accessible a, both technology and business model is going to be affordable to all. Same thing for providing healthcare to the world. We believe that healthcare, again, this country suffers from unique problems that, you know, in many companies, even developing countries don't have. But to enable a rehabilitation in, in a way where people can access rehab, you know, remotely from the privacy of their home, but at the same level of quality, which a lot more data available both for them, both for education and for healthcare, and available for their clinician that takes care of them to personalize their education curriculum and or their healthcare to, to their own need. All that will be automated using all these advanced technologies, using the algorithms rather than for efficiencies and profitabilities for the short term, for efficiency for the long term, because equality creates return on investment for the long term that is a hundred times, if not a thousand times greater than quarter to quarter of the public companies that are currently operating or hopefully, as we see the trend, are starting to move like those four stars. We, we don't hear you. We are mute. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so that, extremely exciting, uh, Amir, that, uh, you know, all these things that previously, you know, you had to be physically in the room for uh, increasingly not only will be uh, made available to everyone, uh, but also hyper personalized, uh, which is which has a ton of promise. Uh, one thing I was I was actually trying to be, uh, you know, show some good uh, moderation hygiene. If we are not speaking, please do mute uh, just so we can make sure that folks in the audience uh, aren't getting any feedback. Uh, but then, of course, when you are speaking, uh, unmute and uh, who I would like to ask. from a place of abundance. I mean, I'm a mindfulness coach. Uh, I realize that our most marginalized population doesn't necessarily have the luxury of thinking abundance, but if you look at history, whether Holocaust survivors or any survivor, it's usually mindset um, that carries them through the challenge. As far as experience with um, health and wellness. I mean, it, it, you know, I live my life to support as with my team to support people to be, to live their best life. And that involves being healthy, especially after a pandemic when so many people have been isolated and they need connection. And we, we've been providing free um, tools, both meditation and classes over the last year plus. Um, as for art, I mean, I've been in the art business. We have a gallery here. I've been uh, very passionate about supporting artists. I think it's, you know, food for the soul and the visual arts are very important. We did have a conversations about uh, 
uh, NFTs. That is not my area of expertise, but I just love the fact that my oldest son called me and said, oh, Ma, Ma, I'm investing in the NFTs and the arts. And he starts to talk to me. I have no idea where he's coming from, but I'm, I'm really trying to share, like, what about the copyright issues? And he, Rauschenberg, Robert Rauschenberg was my mentor and who I worked with for many years. He owns a Rauschenberg that was a gift for one of the holidays and he wanted to sign it. So I said, let me do a little more research. And I'm sure we have some young savvy people listening to this. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, I would love to hear what you have to say so I can give um, good guidance to my son who is following in my footsteps as far as the arts. But I do think experience is, it, it, it's, a, it, it's important. Humanity needs to come together and support and experience together from all, uh, all walks of life. Cool. Oh, yeah, I, I, I caught it this time. Uh, but no, 100. percent it's, it's you know it's about uh, the experiences, uh, and perhaps experience isn't necessarily scarce as long as somebody's in charge of uh, you know producing that and and helping people to get into the right uh, state of mind around that. Now that being said, I want to actually put it to uh, you know someone who might have a, a different perspective, uh, Jonathan. Uh, you know, perhaps there will be certain things that that do remain scarce in the fifth industrial revolution, uh, and how are we how are we as a society to think about that? You know, I think the question, I, I think on two levels, one, and I think this year is we experience for all of us. It's miraculous how well we can keep the world moving when we all had to stay at home. But of course, that's for those of us who have homes to stay in and the ability and technology and knowledge work. And so that quickly does create a split. But I, I believe, David, in the fourth industrial revolution and even to some extent the third, it was high tech plus high touch. Right. There has to be. The, the and with that, and I think we see this deep hunger for real connection and an acknowledgement that it's wonderful that you can have all these online friends, but that's not the same as as deep friends who really know you and that that's a rare thing increasingly in these days. And I see this sort of uh, tech fueled deep loneliness that's a little bit scary. And even this idea that one could be have more satisfaction going into the virtual world because it's so stimulating and so interesting, but that actually pulls you away from uh, from humanity over time. So I think we're going to have to um, find that balance. And historically, industrial revolutions also came with spiritual reawakings. And it'll be really interesting to see, is there a values driven sort of reawakening that emerges with the fifth industrial revolution? Um, because the alternative, unfortunately, is the other kind of revolution, which is really bad for everybody, right? Um, there's a point where you can't have the level of inequality and have social stability over time in economies where, uh, you know, a, a small fraction of the economy owns all the resources. And I'm a market-driven, pro-markets person, um, but we can't kid ourselves that this is sort of true free markets and true free opportunity. And I think the the interesting question is, how do we build trust? And just in, from a U.S. context, the American dream has always been if you work hard, you can you can lift yourself up. But the inequality data would say that's not really true based on place, that, in fact, people born in poverty in the United States have almost no social mobility. And, uh, and it's really people who live in mixed income communities in the United States who still have the American dream. And we're actually seeing that become more true in other parts of the world uh, as well. So it's a global trend. So I think the way we think about cities, but tech uh, in a positive way has shown us we can actually distribute people better. So rather than everybody having to move to the same mega cities, if we look at the two giant macro trends, they're climate change and mega cities, that everybody's been moving into cities because that's where the economic opportunities are. If we could actually distribute, that would help with both climate change and actually distributing economic opportunity. Um, but it's uh, but it hasn't worked yet. And it would be interesting whether tech could actually be part of that solution by making it more possible, not just for knowledge workers, but for some of that abundance then to spread so that people don't need to leave rural areas, that they don't uh, all have to go to the mega cities, but the secondary and tertiary cities can actually be thriving places that are in fact more affordable because affordability has become uh, largely impossible for, for low and even middle income families. So Jonathan, uh, related to that, uh, a, a quick follow on question, uh, and then I want to get uh, Matthew and Kat involved. But um, you know, you, you mentioned the the uh, possibility of the technology, you know, certainly to, to deepen inequalities, uh, but also, you know, conceivably uh, to to take previous resource constraints and and break them. 
uh, you know, that, that how much of, of the challenges do you think we're facing are, you know, potentially spurred by technology or versus using technology, you know, it's, it's more of a political challenge to deploy it in ways that would be advantageous to, to uh, the society? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I would say um, I'm more optimistic in some places than others. I think in medicine, there is the potential, but the incentives are wrong today, right? So you make all the money by inventing the super expensive drugs where you can be paid massive amounts for the people who can most afford if we could actually democratize that and increase distribution. Vaccines are a great example right now, right? If you live in the US, you have a really good chance of getting vaccinated. If you live in Malawi, uh, you've got a, all the doctors are dying. So there won't be any doctors left by the time we get vaccines to Malawi. So I do think we need to move it. Food is a spectacular example of abundance. We have gotten better and better and better at using tech to, to grow food in new ways and provide more food for people. And that's good news, um, though there's a lot more unhealthy food. Housing hasn't really worked at all. And tech hasn't actually helped housing that much yet. And I think that's a big opportunity um, because we can build, the materials are getting better over time. Construction techniques haven't moved fast enough. And I think we need more climate friendly, but also uh, more fine breakthroughs that really drive down affordability so that we can produce way more housing because we have a massive undersupply on the housing side. But I do think tech has um, has a lot to offer there. It just hasn't translated as much as it, I think it could. We're still building houses an awful lot like the way we built them 50 years ago. Very, very interesting point. Uh, and what it sounds like, and I'd, I'd be curious to open this up to the broader panel as well, uh, is that you know the technology is changing very, very quickly, faster than our politics, faster than our systems, faster than we're able to deploy it. Uh, and you know, fifth industrial revolution, fourth industrial revolution, maybe doesn't matter as much uh, if we're still not able to you know really turn those those new developments uh, into you know ways that that apply to people and 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 bring benefit to their life. And uh, Matthew, I was I was curious if you wanted to say a little bit, uh, you know, as a as a company leader. Uh, how do you find the fourth industrial revolution, fifth industrial revolution uh, changing your industry? And, uh, you know, would you say would you say you're optimistic about the way incentives are changing uh, or is it something that uh, that's going to need a broader realignment? Yeah, so I, I come from the uh, cybersecurity world. I've been working in cybersecurity for 20 years. I started my, my business in, in Dublin and we now have a support office in New York and, and a sales office in Paris. And so... Um, I just wanted to, and it's my way to answer your question, to go back on some of the points that have been made uh, just just in the last few minutes um, uh, with regards to managing that change, right? So as we're digitizing everything that we're doing, especially since COVID, everything, you know, some, some of the companies that said it will take us 10 years to digitize our solution or our, pro our service or product, within three months, we were digital. Right. So um, which proves that, you know, you, you can manage change from that direction. But when you when you make changes like that and you make more technology available to more people, you're faced with a number of, of key challenges. The first one is the adoption and the adoption goes back to that question of scarcity. Do we have enough that we can give to everyone? And is it is it affordable? Can they actually find it? Can they understand it? The second one is a cultural aspect. Some people don't want to have tech everywhere. And, um, uh, and, and also because to some extent, uh, it was mentioned earlier on that tech can also bring loneliness. So when you're stuck in your virtual world where you manage everything from behind your computer or your mobile phone or your smartwatch or whatever, um, you're essentially on your own. Yes, you're connected to many more people than the previous generations, but are you really really connected. So in the past, you used to say that to, to trust somebody, you needed to meet them face to face, shake hands, have a cup of coffee, whatever. Now we do this virtually. But the, the challenge with that is that we're, we're losing that kind of um, a trust handshake that we used to get. And now we have to do it virtually, which leads me on to the answer to, to your question is how is this affecting our, our way of life? Um, so we, we often talk about critical infrastructure protection. And especially in, in, in time of a pandemic, we look at the healthcare system, the transportation system, the banking system, government, and so on, as being key for the way we, we, we move forward. And that happens with every revolution, every industrial revolution. Um, what, what's happening today 
is that we are actually all building our own personal critical infrastructure. So I've got right now, all of you probably have three connected devices on you right now. You probably have a cell phone, a watch, and a laptop or a tablet. When you go home, you probably have on average 25 connected devices. And that's 2021, right? So in about 10 years time, you'll have 50 to 60 devices that are connected. So when we talk about scarcity, when we talk about inclusion, and when we talk about the security of all that new ecosystem, we need to, to have a look at what is what will constitute my own critical infrastructure and how does that fit in with the big, the big smart cities that we mentioned earlier on? Is this going to help me reduce uh, my emissions, the way I go to work, the way I work, the way I have a family? And I think that's why it's, it's a fascinating topic. Awesome. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great answer. Uh, and introduces a ton more questions, I think, about what kind of institutions, what kind of infrastructures, what kind of governments, uh, and what kind of policies you need to really manage that, uh, you know, replace that trust, perhaps, that used to come from uh, living down the street from somebody. Uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of that replacement, perhaps, is uh, is at least in, in communities uh, where, you know, you have an automatic trust or you have an automatic, you know, regard or recognition uh, from folks that you can connect with, perhaps, around the world, uh, you know, on the basis of a, of a mutual uh, alignment in something or, or mutual presence somewhere. Uh, but we're just at the very, very beginning of that. And Kat, I wanted to, to hand over to you. Uh, I know, you know, accessibility and, and making sure that folks are included uh, and have access to some of these new opportunities uh, is is a big part of, uh, of why you do what you do. And I wanted to give you a chance to voice that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I think kind of um, jumping on um, what Jonathan was talking about earlier and a little bit of what Matthew just, just touched on, um, you, you know, I, I think I think the greatest injustice and for that matter, smoke and mirrors uh, was thinking that like mindset shift and grit would establish some form of social mobility. It's the greatest smoke and mirrors. And I think, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of the quote and this is not verbatim, but um, where we talk about, you know, all folks need to do is, is just, you know, pull yourself up from your bootstraps. And that implies that someone has boots. Um, and, and, and we forget about that. Um, you know, equality is not the same as equity. And so bringing everyone onto the internet, um, you know, within those, that, those, those three months that Matthew was talking about earlier, um, you know, what, when you're forced to, to adapt, you know, that's what humans do. That's, that's one of the greatest things. Uh, one of, you know, one of our greatest tool sets is our ability to adapt and adopt. But with that rapid adoption, it shed light on, how much of these tools that we use on a regular basis were not designed with marginal groups in mind. Um, and, and I think with that, you know, the, the gift and the curse is that, you know, while some people, a large portion of individuals using technology feel lonely, there are still 49% of people in this world that don't even have access to technology to feel lonely about. And, and with access to that technology means access to healthcare, access to education, access to business building, access to financial services. So we talk about these big cities and we talk about people in rural areas. There are individuals that don't have immediate access to their health care or preventative health care. We see that half the, the, the children that live in this world live because mothers can read and write. Think about what technology can do. Think about how technology enables that. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think there's a there's a, a gift and a curse that comes with this. But um, when we provide um, when we provide software, when we provide tools to individuals that act in their best interest. And I'm not talking about good intentions when we put that technology together. I mean, inherently in their best interest, um, you you see how there is trust built, you know, when when companies come out and. Um, and form a, a strong opinion in the space that they're in. It develops a form of character that people can fall in love with, right? This is, you know, what this, the same the same portion in the brain that that falls in love and, and establishes a relationship is what purchases your products, right? And so, if we can actually build that trust by um, showing up for our customers um, and and showing that we're committed to them um, and taking a strong stance and and uh, and not inherently um, being exclusive, I think we see a lot of the inequity that happens goes away. 
Well, certainly, Ken, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the promise of technology uh, is the idea that you can deliver, you know, these high level experiences and, and you know, the, the values that allow people not just to survive, but thrive uh, in ways that are more accessible and, you know, more personalized and, you know, cheaper to provide in a way that, that theoretically, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get it out to more folks in, uh, in the world. And, uh, you know, that, that's got to be the hope. Uh, well, with, with, with that, uh, and thank you all for, for sharing. I, uh, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, if anybody has a comment or question in the audience, uh, I've seen some claps go up, some, uh, you know, some, some uh, hearts go by. Uh, so if anybody does have a question, you know, please feel free to, to raise your hand uh, or to type a comment in the chat uh, that we can, we can, you know, read out and post to the audience here. Uh, but while we're waiting for that, uh, I wanted to, to ask another question. Uh, and Amir, if it's okay, we can start with you again. Uh, and I think we've, we've touched upon this, but uh, I want to make sure that we're um, you know, that we're, that we're, we're able to drill down on it because I think it's such a key part of what to expect in the fifth industrial revolution, uh, is, you know, as, as Kat mentioned, uh, there's, there's ways that we're going to be, uh, able with technology to more specifically, you know, reach parts of, of people's brain, right? I mean, part of the promise of technology is getting better at, you know, engaging the human interface. And, uh, I was curious, what elements of human nature do you think are not going to change, uh, in the fifth industrial revolution that you think we really need to build around, uh, you know, with our, with our products and our services, uh, and in our societies? And uh, yeah, Amir, if I could put that. Look, I'm listening to everyone, and 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 everyone is very passionate, and and everyone is uh, all uh, coming from a good place and a good intentions. Um, but I spent. And we spent uh, with a group of of uh, of people um, uh, really analyzing what really needs to happen. What do we need to do? What technologies? What disciplines? What experts needs to come together to really make the difference? You can talk about many different things, like we are talking here, but there are fundamental requirements to actually make real progress. Real progress uh, is equality uh, and, and, and uh, to get to equality, you have to, like we say here, you have to equalize, you know, the, 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 the billionaire club with the, the, the ones that under, pov under the poverty line. And it all starts with enabling education and enabling healthcare as a beginning. This is a fundamental requirement. That's it should have been in the Bill of Rights. It should have it should have been made uh, as a as a law like in some countries and it's not in the United States unfortunately. But uh, the point is uh, uh, I believe that the the focus and and the focus uh, has to be <clears throat> in allowing education to be accessible to all uh, in such a way that that uh, you know technology can do it. Now, talking about the brain, you know, for many many years, uh, myself with uh, friends from Stanford and and from USC and and for many many different uh, research institutions around around the world, have done research. Uh, and I'm talking uh, I'm talking specifically about immersive technologies. There's a certain way you can effectively, or the most effective way to influence people, both uh, be, be to educate them and, 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 and provide them healthcare uh, or rehabilitation, uh, speci more specifically, is by accessing the neuroplasticity in the human brain. And the, the neuroplasticity is, 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 a, is requiring the sense of, of uh, of what you will call a um, full presence. So you cannot allow people to log on Zoom in Alabama, uh, in, in some rural area or anywhere around the middle of the country and expect to be able to, to get the same quality of education they will get if they are here in Silicon Valley where I am and, and have the bandwidth and have the you know, the, the services and, and, and the teachers, uh, you know, I, I am, I'm looking at the, 
the opportunities that by enabling anyone to access any uh, any uh, uh, educator and, and, and share, but it has to be and, and share educational classes in, in, a, in a sense where you are physically believed that you are there and you are working with physics or you're studying math or you or you are uh, dealing with chemistry, you know, all the STEM curriculum or, you know, arts and, 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 uh, and uh, liberal and, 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 and any type of other subjects. But you're doing it as you're experiencing, experiencing history as it happens. You need to be immersive, fully immersed into the experience to actually retain that knowledge. And, and then the data that is collected is objective about the student. And the curriculum is being adaptive to that specific student. And the progress of the student is objectively being communicated to the education authorities, including the teachers. And no discrimination and racism can come in play. Again, it's a, it's a big job to, to deal with racism, of course, by itself. And I believe, again, technology will enable a solution for that. And hopefully next year I can talk about that when we join in another session. We are planning on tackling that. But all I'm saying to you is there is proven scientific uh, 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 data that says if you are educating people in in a in a in a immersive experience, doesn't matter the subject matter, you will get much much better results than even the, if they are in a per, in a class in person. Awesome. I, I, Amir, I, I want to say that, that uh, I think, you know, that's a, that's a very powerful point that uh, in a lot of ways, you know, these technologies will unlock, you know, more of human nature perhaps than we've even gotten to explore to date uh, by personalizing things to an extent that people have never got the chance to experience before. Uh, I, I love that uh, optimistic perspective. I actually want to turn it over to Matthew, who I, who I think may have, uh, you know, talking about some of the cybersecurity challenges, uh, you know, ways in which people compete, ways in which people, uh, you know, try to take advantage of these systems. Uh, I'd be really curious to hear your perspective on how that's going to change or evolve in the fifth industrial revolution, uh, you know, both on the, you know, perhaps safety, but also uh, what can people do to, to make sure that they're secure? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, I think that we, you know, we have, we have to go back to human nature. People inherently trust other people. So you get up in the morning, you trust there will be electricity. You get on an airplane, you trust that it's safe. You trust that the, the pilot is going to take you from A to B. Um, what we need to be able to do in order for any technology-based revolution to happen is to be able to not only trust the, um, uh, the technology itself, but the folks that have actually built it. And I, I, I hate to go back to basics, but like it's that idea of security by design and by default and deployment, which is nothing new. It's something that was being pushed by many uh, vendors about 20 years ago, and including Microsoft and, and others. Um, and, and I think that as, as we, we look at our um, social footprint and digital footprint that's expanding and expanding and expanding, we need to make sure that whatever new technology we push out, we gain the trust of, of the users. And somebody said earlier on, uh, I think it was Amir, that, that uh, technology was losing the trust of the people. And um, I, 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 would, I would agree with that, but I also think that it's up to us as people providing good game-changing technology that can address the healthcare issue, address the education issue and, and the, the, you know, the financial gaps and so on, that we do this in a way that we gain the trust of the users. Not just by saying you're going to have two-factor authentication, we're going to encrypt your data and so on. Yeah, okay, that's all great. But if the software was designed the wrong way, if it's integrated with many third parties the wrong way, it actually adds no value. So my, my point is that um, as technology enablers, uh, we need to make sure that we regain the trust of the people. 
so that they actually adopt the technology in a way that they can continue to be trusting or untrusting depending on their risk appetites. Cool. Uh, th thank you. That, I, I'm afraid we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, I don't know where this uh, time has gone. It's, it's been extremely fast. Uh, just, I, I want to make sure that we get one question from the audience, uh, which was alphas. Uh, I, I apologize. Uh, and if, if, feel free to type in the chat as well. Uh, you know, we can we have a little sidebar going on there. But I want to make sure that we get at least one question from the audience. Alpha asked us, how can we reimagine the role of jobs in a new economy in the fifth industrial revolution? Can we structure enough roles that enable humans to contribute meaningly, meaningfully to their localized well-being? And Kat, I saw you started answering that in the chat box. And I was wondering if you could articulate on that, uh, you know, in the uh, in the in the discussion for us here. Sure. So, um, so I think real quick, um, uh, there are a few people discussing a couple of different things, um, you know, regarding it. And this also just goes to jobs as well. Um, it, with technology, um, with data in general, with anything involving jobs or anything we do uh, in the world of technology going forward, it's important to recognize that these data systems that we've relied on so far, it's, it's great to think about them, but we also have to recognize that they're inherently biased. They were fed by a typical group of individuals um, without thinking about the rest of the individuals. And so um, that feeds the justice system, that feeds the healthcare system, um, that feeds uh, the job boards that select individuals um, and don't select individuals. Um, and uh, regarding jobs in general in the future, um, I touched on this a little bit in the comments. I think one thing that we're going to see because we've already and we've already started is that a lot of these like repetitious um, roles will be taken over by, you know, quote unquote robots, you know, technology, um, AI. Um, um, but I think there are a core number of um, roles that will not go away. Um, there will be, um, you know, more roles, I think, or I think through a lot that's happening now, more roles will be birthed. Um, I think we're going to see the workplace in general change, the way we work 